Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Today, I'm going to talk about e-commerce um, and how that gets started. But before I do that, I want to just kind of introduce myself. Um, so about six months ago, I uh, broke out on my own. I started my own company called uh, White Giraffe Design. Um, what we do is we work with, uh, I work with clients, I consult with them to really help them determine the best value they can get from their digital assets. Um, usually the conversation starts with, I need a new website, but really it goes from, how do we make that website work most for you? And a lot of this stems to happen to go into e-commerce. For more reference too, I've been working in this space for about 15 years. I probably built my first website back in 2002 back when it was fun and exciting and new um, and it hasn't the roller coaster ride hasn't stopped uh, technology has advanced so fast um, it is it is a fun ride to be on it, you have to be a constant learner um, and that's what excites me most of it um, but before I jump into everything I want to ask the group what is what is e-commerce yep uh, wow. Yeah, Wikipedia identifies it as uh, the buying and selling uh, through the internet. Um, and there are multiple types of e-commerce, uh, but really for our conversation and probably for the conversations you would have with all small business owners, you really have to focus on B2B and B2C. Um, B2B is B2, business to customer or business to business. Um, and before we get into the technicalities, I really want to kind of highlight why is this important and why is it important now, right? Um, so trending, uh, we'll see that uh, about retail sales and about in 20, 2023 are going to be hitting about $30 trillion worldwide. And I, I, want to, I want to be important with this as we go through this conversation. We're now talking at a global side from a retail sales standpoint, um, not just locally. So, uh, and e-commerce shares of those sales are trending upwards. Uh, by 2023, um, we will see it at least being 22% of, of retail sales. So what does that mean? What does that transition to? Uh, e-commerce turns into almost a $6.5 trillion um, opportunity. Um, then on top of that, e-commerce sales is trending mobily to be almost 70% by 21. So what I'm really getting at here is people are now getting really used to just shopping on their phones, right? So this is, this is critical in understanding when we're getting into um, actually building one of these things, right? We're starting to understand the market, we're starting to understand the trends, we're starting to understand how people are doing it, right? Um, and just to give people more context, why, why is that the case? So a um, couple factors, uh, lower operational costs, um, you know, not needing a brick and mortar to get started, right? You don't need all that investment. You just need a, a website um, and well, we'll get into what you need technically from that. Um, you do have a wider customer reach now, right? So your brick and mortar is, you're stuck to your locality um, with the internet, you can now reach farther and farther. Um, there's also an increase in internet penetration. Again, globally, uh, it's more accessible and it's faster. I think the key is faster globally. There's a, there's a greater demand uh, for products globally as well. Okay. So what does this all mean? Uh, all this kind of means is it's time to set up shop. Um, and now to me, uh, the, new, the new brick and mortar, the new, the new shop is mobile. It's your mobile phone, it's your device, right? So now let's get into the technicalities. The basic process, the basic flow of, of e-commerce looks something like this. Um, up on the top left, the little search icon, this is really, uh, it's representing uh, being found. Your, your shop being found. Then it goes into somebody placing an order. Then it goes into somebody paying for that order. Then we have uh, completing the order. 
then there's a confirmation, and then we get into fulfillment, and then um, then shipment. Okay. So um, the first step being discovered, find somebody finding your product. Now this this is a this is a rabbit hole that we can jump down, but really this is. It goes along with what anyone would need to get any website found, right? It gets into what is your website, your design, what is your paid search, what are you doing for social media, um, what other kind of marketing uh, affiliates do you have, uh, what does your mobile commerce look like, what does your data look like, um, what are your conversion rates, email marketing, SEO, content marketing. So it's, it's really getting into all these avenues to attract eyes and attract people to your product or website, right? Let's stop right there. Are there any questions on that? I don't, I mean, we can talk about some of these specific things. I don't want to go too far down it, but I want to know if anyone has any understanding or needs more clarification on what those are. So if I really want to get into e-commerce, do I need to contract with someone like yourself to help me design my web page and do have a web so that I can So I, I take personally in any project, I take an iterative approach. Having somebody like me would be helpful, but to get started, you don't need that. There's plenty of services out there, as long as you're willing, and we'll get into some of those service here, services here in a second, as long as you're willing to learn as a business owner, which I think anyone that gets into small business is willing to learn, right? Because you're gonna wear multiple hats. Um, you have the capability of getting up and getting going to help validate what you're doing. And then as you grow, you can bring in more people to help support. Does that make sense? So are there online courses? Oh, there's online everything, right? So um, whether it's going to a site, uh, a site like Coursera, where they actually give you uh, eight week classes, or you can even get into just YouTubing specific things. Uh, for uh, YouTubing specific problems, right, and getting your answer. Um, and I'll get into some of the other uh, platforms that are out there to help you set up shops real quickly. They themselves have their own support crew that they can, uh, that they will help you get going because they want you on, they want you selling because that's how they make money. So that's actually a great point you bring up. All these things are great. If you don't have data tracking the results of these, they're worthless, right? So if you can't collect any kind of analytical data that says if people are going to the website, if people are clicking on the button, if people are converting and buying, how and then how are they finding you? How do you make a strategic business decision going forward? All right. To to reference my current the current client I'm working with, he came to me. I need a new website. He had a website. It worked. Right. It had a form. You can convert. Um, but he was seeing most of his traffic from local affiliates, and then anyone that would happen to be down by the harbor. Right. Because that's where his business is. And I asked him some just basic marketing questions of like, what was his initiatives? Where did he want to start marketing? Does he want to start target marketing? He had those. So then I asked him, what does your data look like? What are your analytics? He didn't have any of that. So we're kind of starting over from scratch there, but we're rooting that in the project. So now going forward, we can take small steps to learn where, we, where he wants to spend his marketing money going forward, right? If he wants to do target marketing, to southern Ontario people. We can actually start having analytics to see if that's, that is viable. We now have data to actually have a conversation and ask some direct questions, right? So, yes, if you buy a website for $85, <laughs> 
I would question that. But um, at the very least, as long as you're using it to collect feedback of some sort, um, there's value. Right? And to me, I always try to partner with my, my clients because I, I don't want to set it and forget it. Uh, it. Websites grow like that your company grows. So as you learn more as a company, a business owner, your website should mature with your business. Right. So, um, any other questions before I keep moving? Actually, I recently watched uh, a webinar on uh, 2020 trends on the SCORE webinar website recently. Um, and they are, are actually identifying businesses that are still growing in brick and mortars because of the feel and touch that you're, you're providing the end user or the, the customer. Um, so I think it's just identifying there's need for still brick and mortar that's not going to go away. Um, it's just identifying another revenue stream that is now, it's really kind of, it's an automated, in my opinion, it's an automated revenue stream at this point. As long as your system is set up, um, you know, it's less effort, right? And it usually, I like to see it as a great way to first identify maybe where you should set up your brick and mortar as well. Uh, there's a number of, actually, I don't know if anyone's into coffee, but actually locally in Buffalo, I've noticed a trend where a lot of... Um, Guys that are roasting coffee as a business, they start off small, they start selling through the internet, and eventually once they get a buzz going about them, then they, they, they establish themselves a brick and mortar that people can visit as well. So it's a, it's a great way to kind of get started. You can get started faster. You have lower entrance, uh, to, uh, lower barrier of entrance. Um, and then from there, um, you can take it to the next step of the brick and mortar. And I would actually say too, from if you need loans, you now have you have market validation, right? You can say this is what my revenue is currently, right? So. What I'm, what I'm working on personally is I'm not working on just giving you a website. I'm working on integrating it into your business. And like, how, how do forms work? How do, what is the best practices for SEO, right? So a lot of the work I do, I've been doing this for so long, it's baked into my process. Um, and then usually I'm working, currently I've been working with people that have already, they've already have established businesses, so they kind of see this as a, um, a next step in their growth and evolution. It all depends on the business owner's capacity factor, right? There's nothing wrong with going to Wix and getting something up and running. Like, that's what you got to do when you're starting a business. You got to get it up and running. Um, I'll tell you my, my personal website, it's, it's up and running. I want it to be more and I want it to be better, but... I also have other things to do as well, right? Um, so the first step is always get something up. It validates you as a business, right? It's, it, you don't exist if you don't have a website sometimes. Um, and then from there, you know, bring, bring people in as you feel comfortable and you have the capacity. And basically, if you don't want to, when I don't want to deal with something anymore, <laughs> that's when I'm like, it's time to hire a, a contractor or a vendor to help me with that. So, um, it, it all depends on your personal uh, ability and what you want to learn. I yeah. emphasize that dramatically when I when I talk to people. So Registra I, registration companies out there, everyone does it. Everyone does it. I usually recommend uh, Google Domains, or there's, a, there's another one called Hover.com, uh, because it's specific, you, you pay specifically for the registration, because a lot of people will bake hosting and stuff into that, that cost right up front. Um, so I have them register their stuff there. 
I build their website on a separate server that I run, so then I can guarantee uptime, right? Um, so I'm just hosting files at that point. That's all that means, right? And then I usually have them set up an email through, a lot of people have like Office 360 or um, uh, Google uh, uh, G Suite, right? There's all these other services for email that I, I have that go through those services. So then all we're doing is we're really just, there's this thing called DNS, which is just gonna direct it. It's just gonna tell it every, the system where to go, right? So now, by setting it up that way, we've now broken it into smaller components. So if he doesn't wanna do business with me anymore, and we, he wants to do a website somewhere else, it doesn't affect his email, it doesn't affect his URL registration. It's literally just taking where, that, where I said the DNS, Instead of it pointing to this set of files on this computer or server, it's just pointing to another one. So it becomes a lot easier of a transfer. Um, and yes, maybe from my side, that's probably bad. Like, I, you know, maybe I should lock them in, but it's not fair. It's, it's, I slightly think it's unethical. Uh, whoops. <laughs> um, Can you write that into the agreement up front? Uh, it's, it's not necessarily in the quote unquote agreement. Uh, it's, it's stated up front. That's how it's going to be built. Um, cause I'll, I'll, cause all I'm doing is I'm setting up the staging environment. It's real, I'm just setting up a, a, a place where this is where it's built. This is where we'll proof it. This is where we'll, you know, throw darts at it, you know, we'll change it. And then once we're ready, all we're, all we're doing is redirecting now. We're not migrating anything over it, that. It just becomes lengthy and timely. Painful. We don't want that, right? So, question? So, optimization is a word that's thrown around a lot. Um, really, it's just identifying. It all. It's all rooted in keywords and key phrases, mm -hmm. right? And it's um, making sure that um, you search in Google, and then your first like five things are an ad. Right, so th that's th those that's getting into your paid search ads, right? Um, and then optimizing those are just first of all, it's making sure you're hitting the right keywords for your target market. So a lot of this is rooted still in just basic marketing of understanding your audience, right? Um, I, from a website standpoint, first and foremost from an optimization standpoint, no matter what you're paying, I wouldn't pay for anything at all first, right? Paying was what you do, that's the next step. First, optimize your content and your website performance and security to run the best it can. Then, because what you're gonna do is you're gonna get a better uh, organic search uh, optimization, right? You're gonna start, start with a good foundation. Then from there, that's where you can get into target marketing, and that's where the paid stuff is is handy, right? Um, and then usually, what I like to do is the the home page is not the most important page. And when I talk to clients, we we sit on the home page forever discussing it. But there's different value propositions within a website, whether it's again e-commerce if it's this pair of boots, this is the greatest pair of boots because it's waterproof and the traction, whatever it is, right? That is the value proposition. So from an SEO standpoint or a search engine optimization standpoint, that is the thing that should be optimized, not the homepage. At that point, the homepage is just a gateway to get you to the product, right? So really all these pages in themselves, if done properly, are their own homepage or landing page. Right. Um, what are some of the things that you do to optimize the page? Uh, keyword optimization to me is, I don't, it's like the last thing I'll tackle, right? The first thing is really making sure that the site is performing properly. It's secure. Um, when I say secure, it's, uh, people might notice in the URL up there, it's, there's either HTTP or there's HTTPS. If you see the S, that means it's secure. It's a, it's a security certificate. And the reason for that is if you don't have that stuff in place, Google will get in your way, right? Google will mark that against you. 
And then there's also, there's also just, I come from a design background. I come from a user experience background. There's just some like best practices in regards to getting people to navigate around the page. Okay. So from that standpoint, once all that's kind of in place, that's when you talk about the content and the messaging. But really it's just, you do an SEO audit. So you just kind of look to see, who, first again, you gotta target your user, or target your customer. Who is it, all right? Then how do they see that value proposition? How do they see that? What is the problem statement they're gonna to use to find that? Um, and you can, you can test different ones, right? That's a great thing about digital. I can spin up, for one pair of boots, I can spin up 10 different pages really easily and just change the content. Or we can change layout or we can change other things. And what we're now doing is we're testing to see which one is the most effective. We're even testing to see what kind of, we can even test to see what kind of traffic it drives. You know, maybe, maybe one page, one piece of verbiage gets males in their 20s, but then the other one gets, a different page gets males in their 50s. Um, but this, uh, this goes back to having the data, having some kind of analytical tool attached so you can actually start learning that stuff, right? I'm always I'm always of the opinion to act first as long as we're measuring. So get something up. Uh, like I, I launched my first version of my website. I knew my messaging was completely off. I knew I was I, I knew it was poorly organized, but I needed to get it away from in front of me. And I just I sent it out to people I know and trust. I mean it's live, but I didn't I didn't drive traffic to it, right? So I just sent it out to people I know and trust and I said what does this say to you? Right? What are you What are you interpreting here? Am I, is my message coming across properly? That's the same with any anything that you're putting on the web, right? Um, which then, you know, I took a round of feedback and then I I adjusted and uh, I'm going to do like a that was my my quiet launch, right? My silent launch, and I'm going to do a end of this week. I'm going to do a, a a more verbose launch of that. So. It is, that's why it's not a one and done for me. It's always, it's a, it's a learning step-by-step -step process. So I would totally recommend that you recommend to everyone else, get a website, get it up there, you know, get your name up, general message of what you're doing, some photos, start there. Just be conscious of, like have Google Analytics baked into the background, some analytical tool that's just collecting traffic data. It can even be very rudimentary, just how many people came, how many people left, what pages did they come in, what pages did they leave on, right? Um, did they click anything? From there, you can start having, you can then start rolling down. Because I'll tell you, if they do create a website and then all of a sudden 200 people show up to it, they're gonna start paying attention to it a lot more too. Oh, that's where you get into social media marketing and all this. It, it, it turns into a, it's, it's, you got to feed the beast, right? Like it's, it turns into a thing that will keep growing. But again, that has, that's why in my opinion, it goes, it grows with the business, right? So it all depends on where you're at and what stage, right? So um, let's dive into a couple of the services that you can use kind of going off of, of, of this question of building one. Um, so to build a store, there's plenty of services out there that you can get used to get started. Um, prefer, uh, what I prefer is uh, I use, I work in WordPress mainly, and I use, usually use uh, WooCommerce as well. And these are just, I mean, they're fancy names, but they're just, uh, you know, quick, easy ways to get a, a website up and going. When I say quick and easy though, it also depends on kind of your tolerance for dealing with some of this stuff, right? Um, so what you're really doing here is you're really, here is you're, you're creating an environment 
or a storefront that somebody can come to your, your website and buy something, right? And again, if you're selling things, you don't necessarily, I totally suggest a website, your website is your home base. You don't have to have all the e-commerce though baked into your website. You can also leverage other services. So this is more of a marketplace, right? Where you can sell your goods. I mean, everyone knows Amazon, Google Shop, Walmart actually does it as well. Those are, you know, they're, they're your big box stores, right? It's like selling your product in a big box store. However, there's also a slew of um, niche marketplaces as well. So Reverb is for uh, musical equipment. Etsy is for hand, uh, handcraft uh, made stuff. Uh, New Egg uh, does electronics, is electronic focus. Uh, TripAdvisor, and I'll show you why I put this in here. This is going to my current client. Um, they are, you know, they're selling um, tours and adventures through TripAdvisor, right? So I just want to emphasize this again. You kind of think of these different, different. services as uh, what we would think of today as brick and mortars, right? So this is kind of your brick and mortar store if you're using one of these services, services, right? And then this is like again more or less I'm going I'm I'm selling my goods through an actual a, a retailer. Right? There's also additional services on top of this. So this is why uh, they're, they're inventory management systems. Okay. So what does this mean? Uh, this is the example I'm going to give. It's Bumkun. This was actually made by TripAdvisor. What is great about this? So with my client, we are, he's scheduling tours, but instead he's, we're posting them on his website. And then Bokun will also publish them on TripAdvisor and other travel sites. So now what I have, instead of me as a, a small business owner having to go to, uh, let's just say 10 different websites to monitor the activity, I now have one location that is monitoring and maintaining my schedule. Again, he's doing tours, right? So he's maintaining his schedule across all those platforms, um, which again is, is an inventory management problem, right? And by doing this, we, we now are allowed to get out there to multiple platforms where, where our potential clients are to be seen. You don't have to remember all these different platforms. Just, I would say, remember if, again, why somebody's starting out and if they're starting to venture into multiple platforms to advertise or to sell their goods, find there, there are always services out there that will kind of bring that all together. So as the, for the end user, you have one place to manage it. That becomes feasible, right? If you had five, six, seven, it's not feasible. Well, it's not maintainable. So, so then the other piece of this, so we talked about um, attracting eyes, somebody selecting something, right? Now, now we have to place an order, right? So then there's other services on top of that that will help do that, right? Now, these are the ones that basically process the credit card transaction, right? Most of these are 2.9% plus 30% per transaction. It's kind of like a standard rate that I've seen across them all, the reason I know. The two that I'm most familiar with, not making them better, uh, PayPal and Stripe, uh, kind of the bigger players, but uh, there's a couple more up there as well, and there's more than that. Um, a lot of your inventory management systems and a lot of your vendors will actually just directly connect into these. So all you have to do is like get an account in one, get an account in the other, and just tell them that you have an account. Like they'll have a they'll have a sign in functionality through them, um, so now it, it becomes an automatic transferring of data. Right, it's just uh, the end user, the business owner, setting that up. Right, um, and a lot of everything's becoming more and more intuitive now. They'll actually tell you to do it. So um, orders complete, yay! You got money, right? We sold something digitally. What happens there? So there's usually a confirmation email that then is then sent out by these systems uh, to confirm with the, um, the client and then also uh, the retailer. Um, 
Now we get into the fulfillment shipment side of things. Um, <laughs> um, I'm starting to learn more about warehouse management systems actually recently. Um, they do have the ability to actually link right into um, their clients' Amazon accounts or wherever their vendor accounts, wherever they're selling. So they literally can just, the data just goes to them and says ship something, right? That being said, it's not required because again, these are small businesses. That's something the small business owner, the small business owner can fulfill and ship themselves, right? And I would say these should not become obstacles for small businesses to get started. This is where they need to grow into of having somebody do fulfillment and shipment um, later down the road. But again, going back to my uh, coffee example earlier, a lot of those people were just selling locally and that's where they did their advertising. They targeted locally. And as a result, they would ship and fulfill locally as well. Um, doesn't mean you can't then expand uh, and then get into the whole fulfillment shipment. Um, a lot of people, the other thing with fulfillment, uh, Amazon is making things more difficult. Uh, people are having expectations of two-day shipping, right? Um, that's not necessarily feasible. You just have to be upfront at the beginning. I actually recently read a, a, a good case study on on Amazon and how they were able to do their two-day shipping. They literally went in, they had a fulfillment problem and they went in and automated a lot of it through digital services. And then what they identified through that is they could actually get things out in two days. So it wasn't them promising two days and then figuring it out. It was, they used digital tools to then figure out um, to solve their fulfillment problem, which then they realized from a value add to their customers, they can get things out in two days, which then said, we're gonna, we're gonna introduce Prime, a uh, hundred bucks a year, and you'll now get two day shipping, which then Prime has grown into what we know today, right? Of uh, videos, books, all the other stuff. Just bring back full circle of the process overall. Um, Um, that's a great question. I'm not, so if you, if you buy from a marketplace, that's why like Amazon and Google and Walmart, that that's great. But people like shopping there because it's a trusted brand, which then they, they will then, they will handle that. Right. To a point, I had to bring the hammer down to the place to get that. I'm going to try to Well, so that's, I mean, that's, that's it in itself, right? Like the inter the internet in itself is kind of self-governing, right? Especially if on Amazon, like they're only going to get away with that one or two times before that's with all the user ratings and the vendor ratings. Whenever I buy something from an un somebody I don't know, like I, I look at ratings, right? right? And I think the only way to do it is a little due diligence on the buyer's part. And then I know the marketplaces are doing their best to, to weed that out. And then read, read the comments, read the responses. So just to, to get, so we got the process and now I just wanted to talk about some of the challenges real quick. And this goes into the tax question earlier. Um, yes, you have to charge taxes for that state that it was purchased from, right? So if you're in New York state and I'm, I am not a tax person, so if I screw this up, I apologize. But you are respon I do know you are responsible for the taxes in those different uh, locations. That's why with, when you buy something on Amazon, you'll see the tax change once they know, you won't have a tax until they know where you're located, right? From a tax, uh, specifically, there's a lot of those, a lot of those services that we talked about, they have that kind of baked, they have that baked into their, their system, right? Because they know it is an important piece of this, right? But from the small business side owner, they need to make sure that that is being fulfilled. Um, 
and I've never sold anything from through Amazon, so I don't know if they collect it and pay it or if it gets pushed over and then the small business has to pay it. But I'm, assu I'm assuming Amazon would. But they calculate. They will calculate it, yes. Mm -hmm. The other things that you kind of deal with here, uh, I mean, there's the fear factor going into are they reputable? Um, there's a touch and feel factor. This is going into the brick and mortar. Like, I don't buy clothes online anymore unless I bought from that company previously because I usually have to send it back because I'm a tall man and usually it's sleeves are too short, pants are too short. Um, uh, what are the other big ones here? Um, online security this is a big one too uh, with you know, data and uh, privacy, all that other stuff. Um, this is why you're going into make sure that going back to HTTPS, uh, that's the first step of security, right? There's a lot of other stuff, but again, if you're selling on, this is the this is the value of the Walmart.coms and the Amazon.coms. You're, you're then in their security ecosystem, which is, is it's valuable. It's, it's worthwhile. Um, and then you get you know logistics and shipments of services. So there's it's not full, you know. E-commerce, uh, selling stuff through, there's a lot of great things about it. There's still some things that are lacking from it. It's not perfect. So. With that, I know we've had a bunch of questions already. Um, and this is slated to go to eight, so we still have 10 more minutes. So what other questions are there? Do you want to talk about spam and hacking and passwords? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so hacking, uh, generally speaking, hacking is, is it's done more socially. And what I mean by that is they don't, most hackers are not just gonna like find some back door to weasel their way into, right? Um, they're gonna have figured out your password um, some way, right? And that's what spam is really good for. Um, I don't know, I've gotten these a couple times where people will send me something, it looks like it's from Netflix. And you, you gotta be very careful at looking at the URLs of where it's going. Um, because they'll be like, oh, something's wrong with your account. Go, and then you go in and you go to like type in your password. And it's just, it's a social hacker trying to get your, your login credentials. Because a lot of people too will use the same login credentials for everything, right? So really the best way to deal with hacking um, is you gotta change up your passwords. Um, actually Google, if you use a Chrome browser, they, they do a really good job at helping you pick different passwords and storing them for you so you don't have to remember them. Um, there's also services, I use one called LastPass that is really good for that as well. And it'll also tell you when you have, you can make a better password. Um, and the other thing for that too is just be diligent, like getting a, a email, I just, I don't, if I don't know the person sending me the email, I just don't click on the link. Right, like it's just a best practice I have. Well, by so they are. Um, I've dealt with this being in the um, marketing side of things. You're supposed to, depending on the system they are, are supposed to automatically take them off of that and not to be able to respond to ever again. Again. If it's a reputable company, that's what will happen. If if it's not, or it's somebody trying to hack you, it it could be something different. I've had that issue, and I'll tell you too. I I've tried to I every occasionally uh, I try to go through and just do the unsubscribe to all the stuff. I'm just I'm sick of seeing in my email box. I've had a lot of success with it, but sometimes stuff still comes around. So there are. I've noticed sometimes they have different settings for different kind of communications. So sometimes just hitting the uns un unsubscribe will just unsubscribe you to their newsletter communications, but then their monthly promotions you're still available for, right? Well, the worst problem is the sophistication of the phishing. Mm -hmm. the stuff that
Oh no, it's it. I mean, it doesn't. It would take me probably thirty minutes to an hour to whip up an email that looked like it came right from Netflix, right? It's not hard, especially if you've gotten them from before. You can literally copy and paste them, right? And that's where it, again it goes into the the person on the other side, um, just doing due diligence of like, I, you know, why is Netflix make in my example, why is Netflix sending me this? I was just streaming something on my TV by them yesterday, right? This doesn't make any sense. And you can do, you can, um, you can inspect where that link is going. You just hover over it, and usually in the bottom left, we'll show you where it's going. Um, and if it's not Netflix.com, then you know it's it's not worth going to. So even if you do go somewhere, look at the top browser. Look what it says before you enter any information. So. Um, so thank you for that. So white draft design. Um, I was coming up, I was trying to come up with ideas and then I literally got so frustrated with it. I looked to my two year old and I said, Hey buddy, what's your favorite animal? What's your favorite color? And now we'll wait your draft. So. The reason I ask that is, uh, you know, we have boards over here in the small business group. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was, uh, you know, give it, a, give it to a two-year-old. And uh, I think a lot of it, too, was uh, a lot of the design companies I envy, um, they have kind of some of these outlandish names. So that's where I was like, I couldn't do it appropriately. So that's why I, f I figured a two-year-old could uh, be a little bit more uh, outlandish than me. Thank you, Thank you everybody. I appreciate it.